Tick tock, time to rock. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone who's watching from all over the world. I'm your friendly neighborhood philosopher, David Wood, and with me now is the author of the Quran. <laughs> We've got the author of the Quran with us, ladies and gentlemen. Whoa, is that me? Who's watching? Oh, do you guys hear that, or is that just in my headphones? Sorry, guys. Rob, I do need to know, Robert. Do you hear that? I don't hear anything. I did. Okay, for a good, good, good. No, I was wonder. I was wondering if uh, uh, I'm using a totally new setup here. I'm using a totally new setup because, uh, as I mentioned, no, uh, a bunch of people I contact and try to get live don't use Skype anymore. So I had a new setup, but uh, I was interested in whether videos that are playing on my computer would also would just be audio to me or audio to you. Um, and I started hearing one of them play, so well, it's actually our live stream. But uh, if you didn't hear it, did anyone else hear it? Did anyone else hear? Okay, no, I've turned it off. I've turned it off, everyone. I was just wondering if you heard it or if I only hear it through my headphones because that's kind of a again totally new, totally new setup here. Looks the same to you. It is totally different for me. So I'm uh, messing around with some stuff here. Anywho. We've got the author of the Quran, and I can actually prove it. <laughs> can actually prove it here, but see, look, ah, there we go. Robert Spencer, Robert Spencer, author of the Quran. This is good because you can hopefully clear up a lot of things um, since you are literally the author of the Quran. How you doing, Robert? Just great, David, just great. You know, I'm glad that Quran Writing it was a big project, and I'm glad it's done. I was uh, I was live with a Ratio Christie group in Texas, and it was during the Q and A. And the guy who runs the group goes, uh, "What Quran should we get? I mean, is there even such a thing as a critical Quran?" <laughs> I go, "Well, actually, right here." So it actually worked <laughs> actually worked out pretty well. But uh, everyone, uh, two books you definitely need to get if you don't already have them in your library. Uh, the History of Jihad, definitely need to have that by Robert Spencer, and The Critical and the Critical Quran, which you, you would have to pre-order now, but links to both of those are in the description box. Now, Robert, uh, it's, it's Ramadan, so we predicted, we predicted that there wouldn't be any jihad because, um, well, Muslims are going to be too focused on growing closer to Allah and getting along as a community and getting along with the world and celebrating uh, the feast of Ramadan. I don't know why they call it a fast. I mean, they gorge themselves with food multiple times per day and then sleep all day. <laughs> I don't know why it's called a, I don't know why it's called a fast to this day, but uh, yeah, but since we're always told, always told the, 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 the only people who wage jihad are people who've misunderstood their religion. So obviously during Ramadan, when people focus specifically on their religion, they're going to, get much closer to the truth and therefore become much more peaceful. So I, I doubt you have anything for us this week, but what do you got? Well, you know, David, of course, uh, Muhammad was asked in a famous tradition, can you tell me a deed that equals the value of jihad? And he said, I cannot find such a deed. And so if you want to get closer to Allah, waging jihad is a real good way to do it as far as jihadis are concerned. And so there's a, usually quite a bit more jihad in Ramadan than there is the rest of the year, as if there isn't enough already. Let's start with the United States, shall we, since we're both here, as far as I know. Uh, California, a man was sentenced to 20 years in prison. His name is Bernard Augustine, and he's a apparently a convert to Islam who uh, wanted to join ISIS he uh, actually visited websites about the ISIS recruitment process, and he uh, watched a video. He he, uh, he I'm sorry, went to a website that had the heading: "How does a Westerner join ISIS? Is there a recruitment or application process?" And uh, the wild thing about this guy, Bernard Augustine, is that uh, he was completely honest during his trial which, as you know, David, is unusual when it comes to this because Muhammad himself said, war is deceit. 
And so they said, what do you think about ISIS now? They were probably setting him up to say, oh, I hate ISIS now. Now I have learned that ISIS is completely un-Islamic. Please give me a suspended sentence. But what he said instead was that he thought that the beheading videos were good and were really cool and that he still hoped to get uh, a chance to work for ISIS. And so they said, are you actually saying that you would do it all again and go back today? And he said, no, tomorrow when you let me off. But they didn't. They gave him 20 years in prison. And presumably that is where Bernard Augustine can be found even as we speak. Uh, I, I'm sorry, Robert, but I didn't hear anything you said after the word ben Bernard. Um, <laughs> you're telling me <laughs> that someone named Bernard. <laughs> well, that's probably why. That's, we have to compensate for that. His entire life, kids made fun of him for being named Bernard. And he said, I'll show you. I'll show you all. That would actually be the theory because they always need a theory for why someone became a jihadi. It can't actually be that someone uh, converted and found out that Islam calls for jihad. And so it's always got to be some psychological factor. And so they've actually got one here. Um, if my name were Bernard, I would probably want to join ISIS as well. Um, just it also a name, a cool Arab name. And then you're, you don't have to be Bernard anymore. Yeah, Al Bernardo, <laughs> Al Bernard, <laughs> Al, Al, Al Bernardi, Amriki, <laughs> Al Bernardi, Al Amriki. That'd be awesome. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's go up to upstate New York, Mount Morris, New York, very sleepy town. And in Mount Morris, New York, there was a gentleman from Ottawa driving through town named Badri Ab Ahmed Mohammed. And he was speeding. And so Mount Morris, New York police probably don't have a whole lot to do. They stopped him for speeding and found that he appeared to be very nervous. Finally, they said, do you have anything illegal in the car? And Badri Ahmed Mohammed, just as honest and ingenuous as Bernard Augustine, said, why, yes, yes, I do. And so in a search of his car, 58 illegal guns were discovered. Apparently, uh, Badri was running guns to somebody. We don't know who, because, of course, these news reports are completely sketchy and incurious. But uh, it does seem as if he was trafficking in firearms. And, of course, the possibility cannot be ruled out that he was getting the firearms to a jihad-related group. Even if he wasn't, however... Often we find that this kind of legal, illegal activity, including drug sales as well, is used to finance jihad activity. Not saying this is what Badri Ahmed Mohammed was up to. Maybe he was just your garden variety arm smuggler, but the possibility cannot be ruled out by anyone informed about these issues. Um, yeah, uh, jihadis of the world, uh, you should spend a couple of years like playing poker or something like that to get a good poker face for when the cops uh, start asking you what you've got in your car. Because um, if you're not used to that sort of thing, you might just start blurting stuff out. Well, yes, I have uh, dozens of weapons in my car. It's not as if he can't tell a lie. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, deceiving the unbelievers is right there in the Quran, chapter 3, verse 28. Yeah, uh, note and, what, and, and notice if he just kept his cool when he got pulled over. I mean, all right, you're going to get a ticket and then bye. There you go. Mm -hmm. Dumb. Let's go to Chicago. Sarah Abdul Rasul. Now, Sarah is a name that suggests that she's a Christian. However, oftentimes you find Muslims in the United States taking on names of that kind because they're easier for Americans to deal with and pronounce. Uh, the last name, Abdul Rasul, that is slave of the messenger, very strongly suggests that we're dealing with a Muslim. In any case, she is a Palestinian, and she went into a bar. Palestinian walked into a bar. And, uh... <laughs> hey, here we go. 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 Hold up. Hold up. Hold up. Hold up. <laughs> All right. A jihadi walks into a bar. 
Jihadi, yes. walk, Jihadi walks into a bar and the bartender says, what are you doing? This, we serve alcohol here. You're not supposed to be in here. And the Jihadi says, oh, I thought this was a different place I was supposed to blow up. It's good. All it's right, good. I'll try that one. <laughs> okay, Sarah Abdul Rasul goes into the underground Chicago, a Chicago bar, orders a drink, notices that the bartender is wearing a Star of David necklace. Sarah Abdul Rasul flies into a rage demands that the bartender take the necklace off, says, your people are killing my people. Whereupon the bartender says, oh, you're Palestinian. I didn't mean to upset you. And Abdul Rasul responded that she actually hates Jews, threw her drink at the bartender. And she didn't just throw the drink. She threw the glass, injuring slightly the bartender's shoulder and fled. Uh, the... Uh, Glass incidentally struck the bartender's neck, which is interesting since we do have the specification when you meet the unbelievers, strike the necks. This is a new and creative way to do this. Usually the way it's done involves blades, but a drink glass will do. In any case, uh, the hatred of the Jews that Sarah Abdul Rasul openly espoused does also make it strongly likely that she is a Muslim in that the Quran specifies that the Jews are the worst enemies of the Muslims, in chapter 5, verse 82, says in multiple passages that they are scheming against Allah, that they uh, hate the Muslims, that they are trying to destroy the plans of the Muslims, and so on. And it's just, uh, I mean, the, the level of hypocrisy here, like even if you, even if you are convinced that um, that the nation of Israel is oppressing your people to say, hey, you know, therefore I go after any Jew I happen to run into as soon as I can identify the person as a Jew. That's specifically what everyone is told not to do when it comes to Islam. Uh, in other words, no matter how, you know, no matter what horrible things are going on in Pakistan or Saudi Arabia or Iran or how many terrorist attacks there, we are constantly reminded and I say it too, and so do you. Hey, don't go around randomly targeting Muslims because of what other people have done. Uh, suddenly, suddenly, perfectly acceptable, perfectly acceptable if you're talking about Jews. Yeah, you know, also this kind of collective punishment and collective responsibility is something that we see all the time from jihadis who attack random Jews in Europe on a, uh, an alarmingly frequent basis because they blame them. And recently, of course, we had the Colleyville, Texas hostage situation where a Muslim went in, took hostages in a synagogue because an Al Qaeda operative is in prison. And so he blamed the Jews because, of course, they control the world, in his view, for imprisoning the Al Qaeda operative. So he figures that these this random group of Jews in a synagogue in Texas, they're responsible or they're all connected up. It's uh, interesting, in light of what you say there, David, about how uh, we're always warned that it's so terrible to act as if Islam has something to do with the actions of individual Muslims. And yet this is what is constantly done by some Muslims against Jews. Uh, last week, David, I told you about a case, very strange case in Seattle, where a gentleman named Tyrone Bernard Wells told police that he had killed a woman because he was reading the Quran and the Quran gave him the idea that he ought to kill her. I do believe we discussed that last week. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And a new detail came out in this week about that story. And that is that he called 911 after he killed her. And he said this, he, he oh, excuse me, just a second. He said, uh, it was on my account. And the operator replied, hold on, you said the murder was on your account? What does that mean? And he said, yes, ma'am, that means in the name of Allah, I murdered her. And what's interesting about that is that Seattle Times reported that the motive was not known in this killing. And yet here's a man who now twice has affirmed that the killing had to do with what he read in the Quran and somehow had to do with his acting in the name of Allah. But the local media will not report that because, of course, it doesn't fit the media paradigm that Muslims are always, and in every case, victims.
Did we talk about the uh, ricin guy last week? I think we did. Ishtiak Al Ali Saim. We can recap. Well, uh, he just accidentally bought 800 uh, ricin seeds when he meant to buy eight, or so he says. Oops. So he was going to plant them as a decoration, not ricin, castor beans that you make ricin out of. Mm -hmm. He was going to plant them as a decoration in his house, but. He accidentally bought a hundred more than he, uh, uh, seven hundred ninety-two more than he wanted, and of course he has now been sentenced. That, but uh, I that don't... always that always happens to me. Yeah, yeah, I've accidentally bought uh, hundreds more of things that I want. Did we talk about? I don't believe we talked about Malik Sanchez, did we? Or did we? I'm Not sorry. That I recall. Go ahead. You'll have to. Sanchez is this guy he used to be a famous YouTuber. Uh, he's not so active anymore called smooth sanchez he's about the opposite of smooth he would walk around new york and be an obnoxious jerk essentially that was his act he would walk around new york and somebody was with him filming him and he would uh yell at people harass people insult people he even hit one guy at one point but uh, apparently the guy didn't press any charges um i watched hours of this creeps videos actually because i wanted to see where he actually went into I didn't go into the restaurant, excuse me. He, uh, this was during the height of the COVID business. And so he, the restaurant was outside and he walked up to diners outside the restaurant and he said that he was going to enhance their meal. And then he said, bomb detonation in two minutes. I take you with me and I kill all you. I kill all you right now. And I kill all you for Allah. Uh, and uh, he went on and on in that vein. Um, terrifying various people who were here able to hear him they fled he was sentenced the other day no jail time he's uh, acknowledged that it was an obnoxious thing to do i do wonder though if he had been saying anything else if he'd been saying uh kkk or i'm a white supremacist or something if he would have gotten off so easily yeah it'd be international headlines i expect so uh in boston our uh, old pal Jokhar Tsarnaev, the Boston Marathon bomber. Interestingly enough, his death penalty sentence has been reinstated, and he's appealing. He doesn't want the death penalty. And I find this very strange, because isn't death for the sake of Allah the highest goal? That's a Muslim Brotherhood motto. He made it very clear that he was doing this for Allah and for Islam. Has Jokhar Tsarnaev lost his faith? Is he no longer looking forward to the virgins? It has to be asked, because if he were a pious, believing Muslim at this point, you would think he would be happy that the death sentence was reinstated. Yeah, some of the uh, some of the attacks um, I recall reading about over the years were um, kind of, a, you know, suicide by cop situation where jihadis would dress up like they've got a bomb even if they don't have a bomb just so they can run it run up into an area and and police will shoot them so that they can so that they can go to paradise being killed by the unbelievers but yeah that was uh uh i'm sure a lot of people here know but that was muhammad's highest wish he said i just want to uh, i just want to be martyred and then come back to life and then get martyred and then come back to life and then get martyred and then come back to life and then get martyred i just want to uh, kill and die and then come back so i can kill some more and die again and come back and so on and so uh my goodness why in the name of common sense would you want to be sitting in a cell for the rest of your life knowing that you could uh you know start getting your reward there yeah and it's interesting because we know that his brother tamerlan who was killed during the whole business at the start, uh, he was a true believer. I and mean, he was he was very dedicated to Islam. And he got his brother into it when his brother was sort of a slacker dude, you know, smoking a lot of pot and wasting his life. And now I'm wondering, you know, the brother's dead and he's sitting around in jail all day. Mm -hmm. Maybe he's thinking it over. Yeah, and... and I'm sure there are lots of people like that where they grow up in an environment where, you know, they're around some some guy or some sheikh or something like that who's encouraging jihad. And it's sort of all they know is that this is the truth and this is the coolest thing I can do. And this is the best thing there is in life. 
and then they go out and do something and then all of a sudden they're not around that person anymore and they're just they've just by themselves and they've got time to think and not surprising that some of them would would start to realize man i have really just destroyed my entire life any hope for the future over something that i'm just not sure about and you know especially if you got the death penalty wow i'm about to i'm about to be killed and i'm not sure about this stuff anymore so i just want to live so maybe i can figure things out at some point also in boston uh sheikh abdullah farouk the imam of mosque praise allah in boston he got some interesting uh attention this week because he preached a sermon where he said we are in america we are not in afghanistan we are not in sudan now most people would say yeah hooray we are not in afghanistan we are not in sudan we're not getting shot at Mm -hmm. we're not starving we're not living a precarious existence but abdullah farouk was not happy about this He said, we are not in places where women have the sense to cover themselves. We are not in Egypt, Morocco, Pakistan, India. We are in a land where disobedience to Almighty Allah is what is the norm. Disobedience is normal. And he went on to excoriate the United States for uh, all the various manner, uh, various fashionable libertinism of the day, which is all uh, true. There's no doubt that uh, these things go on. And there are many people in the United States who don't approve of them, but they are the price of living in a free society where morality is not a matter of coercion, but a matter of the individual and the freedom of the individual will. Uh, Abdullah Farouk, of course, does not come from that kind of a background. And he believes that morality is a matter of coercion and should be. And uh, people should be afraid to step out of line. So he doesn't like it here so much, but he ain't leaving because this is all part of his hijra. He is here to bring Islam to the United States. It, it, it is very strange, isn't it? That, I mean, you've got multiple, multiple Sharia compliant hell holes in the world. And, uh, and you, you've, you've, got, you've got the entire spectrum. You've got the entire rainbow of various degrees of Sharia compliance in various Muslim countries. You've got, you got places where they'll, they'll, they'll kill you for apostasy or for blasphemy. You've got other places where they'll sentence you to prison for those crimes. you got, you know, you got the entire spectrum. And yet you can take all of those countries and if you opened the doors to Western countries, like 80 to 90% of those countries would leave and come to a Western nation. And then as soon as they get here, why, why aren't you like the Sharia compliant hell holes that we came from? Why can't you be more like them? So weird. It's chapter four, verse 100, David. I happen to have the critical Quran right here. Do you? Yes. And if we huh. crack it up to chapter four, verse 100. Ooh, this is rich. <laughs> <laughs> You will find it says, whoever emigrates for the sake of Allah will find much refuge and abundance in the earth. And whoever forsakes his home, a refugee for Allah and his messenger and death overtakes him. His reward is then obligatory upon Allah. Now, an obligatory reward from Allah, that's big because Allah just weighs your good deeds and your bad deeds in the big scales. Chapter 21, verse 47. And so. You don't know how many good deeds you have or how many bad deeds you have or how much each one of them weigh. But if you emigrate for the sake of Allah, his reward, he has to give it to you. And so that's got to be big. Yeah. A- anytime Allah with uh, one of those giant thumbs on one of his two right hands it agrees that he's going to put that giant thumb on the, on the scale of your good deeds to weigh it down to make sure you definitely get into paradise. You want to pay attention, that sort of thing. Yeah. And so uh, it's understandable that Abdullah Farouk is not going anywhere. All these people, I wrote an article about him and all these people were writing, well, then leave. That's not what he was saying. What he's saying is we have to Islamize the United States. Yeah. Good luck with that. (laughs) Well, you know, it's it's funny because, I mean, on the on the on the one hand, you think, eh, uh, you guys aren't growing fast enough uh, here. 
um, the, the number of people who convert is basically offset by the number of people who leave. And that was that's a statistic from several years ago before the rate of apostasy was uh, accelerating. And the rate of apostasy continues to accelerate. So you're thinking, uh, you guys are you guys are going to be losing ground here over time. You're not going to be taking us over at at any time and yet and yet we've seen some remarkable success just by constant whining about being the true victims in all of this no i mean every terrorist attack that ever happens was uh used by western media organizations to get more muslim spokesmen on tv to tell everyone about islam so every time there's a terrorist attack it was oh we we know that that most Muslims do not support this terrorist attack. So let's get all let's get all the most popular Muslim speakers on our network to tell everyone what real Islam is about. No, oh, Islam is just a religion of believe in one God. You believe in one God, don't you? And they preach, and then you you get these waves of conversions after every terrorist attack. And it was, I mean, it was like it was like it was it was like they were encouraging them to launch terrorist attacks. Hey, the more terrorist attacks you launch, the more airtime we'll give you to tell everyone about Islam and, and win more converts. Very, very strange stuff. So on the one hand, I think you, you guys aren't going to really, aren't going to really take over. And I don't believe, I don't believe they are. Um, but given, given the small minority of the population they make up, they do have a, a lot, ton of, ton of influence over everyone, politicians, journalists, all of Hollywood, all of the entire education system powerful thing that victimhood status yeah i was amazed uh when we had last september the 20th anniversary of the 9 11 attacks and i saw article after article after article not just one not just two not just five but all over the place the primary focus was how muslims supposedly suffered in america after 9 11 it was as if you would have thought the attack was on the muslims on 9 11 from the way that the coverage went yeah, and I, uh, I, I remember uh, I read an article, I think it was in the New York Times, but it was by Aziz Ansari. So he's a comedian. Um, I like Aziz. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I know who that is. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, 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 I only saw him in one one show, uh, that uh, that one with Ron Swanson. Uh, yeah, Parks, Parks and Rec Parks and Recreation. Yeah, so yeah, he, he was he was a hilarious character. I thought he was cool, but he, he was uh, he wrote an article again. I believe it was for the New York Times. And it was complaining about, um, you know, how Muslims were treated after 9-11, how everyone was suspicious of Muslims after 9-11. And it was, he was explaining how, because of the way people viewed his mom and so on, that she was scared to go around and scared that everyone is out to attack her and so on. And how Muslims had to live in this state of constant fear that there was going to be this, uh, this backlash against them. And all I could think was, was while, while, reading this was like how do you not how do you not spot the hypocrisy here right you're, you're, i mean he's 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 literally saying oh you know and then a woman's hijab was pulled on in a supermarket so this sent us all into a frenzy of not trusting anyone anyone might be out to attack us right and they don't spot the hypocrisy well how do you how are you condemning people for saying wow jihadis are you know blowing up buildings and stuff like that and Oh gosh, I'm I'm kind of scared here. I, I'm kind of scared, right? So, it's like, why why are you looking at everyone with suspicion over what some individuals did when that's what you're condemning? <laughs> that's what you're condemning in other people. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, for for any of you who do not get this, if Aziz Ansari is saying, "Hey, it makes perfect sense," given a small handful of you know people not liking Muslims or being suspicious about Muslims or uh, uh, even harassing Muslims or something like that here in the West, that you then are, are in a position of fear and you can't, you don't know who to trust. Uh, how do you then say, hey, you know, after the you know terrorist attack here and terrorist attack there and terrorist attack here and terrorist there, how dare you be at all concerned about Islam? Uh, just weird, weird situation. They just don't get it. Yep. And also it, it always strikes me when somebody writes a weepy article like that, about how terrible Muslims have had it in the United States since 9-11. I think, well, here you, here's a guy who's a rich, successful uh, comedian and actor, and he's at the top of his profession. Everybody loves him. Where is the terrible racism and discrimination that he suffered? He shouldn't have suffered any racism or discrimination, mm -hmm. but quite obviously 
If he had suffered any, it did not prevent him from achieving fantastic success in the same country where he's decrying this terrible racism and discrimination. Yep, it, yeah, it, 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 it is it is it is strange when it's it's not just it's not just someone complain you know complaining to be a victim. It's you know someone who's world famous and loved by everyone and is on TV and shows regularly complaining about being a victim of the oppression in in America. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Over in France, of course, we know there's always going to be a lot of news from France in Toulouse. In the cathedral of Saint Etienne, a Muslim gentleman walked in during mass, walked up to the altar, and left a bomb in the in front of the altar. The uh, bomb squad was brought in, and it was all defused. But uh, actually, it was found not to have a firing device. So he was apparently just trying to strike terror in the hearts of the enemies of Allah, as per chapter eight, verse sixty of the Quran. And he has now, of course, been announced he's suffering from psychiatric disorders. There are so many people who suffer from psychiatric disorders that take the form of them believing in Islam and thinking that it means they have to do violence to unbelievers. I'm really surprised this is not in DSM-5 as a well-known psychiatric disorder, since it is so very common. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it is a... Uh... It is weird how it so frequently goes in one direction. I mean, to be clear, you do have people with mental illnesses. You do have people who are just crazy. They do crazy things. That's why they they end up in mental hospitals and so on. But it's weird how so many people with mental problems decide to terrorize the unbelievers in the name of Allah. <laughs> and it's uh, even though it's almost universally ascribed to mental illness, it is yet not a recognized category of mental illness itself. I find that very strange. There needs to be a concerted study of what kind of mental illness it is that leads people to think they need to do violence to unbelievers in the name of Islam. Sudden jihad syndrome. Indeed. <laughs> sudden, uh, also sudden, a, sudden Allahu Akbar syndrome. <laughs> yes. Speaking of Allahu Akbar... <laughs> I love your segues, man. Your segues are awesome. <laughs> Speaking of Allahu Akbar. Uh, there was a gentleman in France also who uh, walked up to a homeless man and began to stab him and then turned to the homeless man's dog and began to stab the dog all while screaming Allahu Akbar. Now, of course, we know Islam hates dogs. Muhammad ordered all the dogs except hunting dogs to be killed and said that the uh, passage of a dog or a woman in front of you while you're praying will invalidate the prayer and angels don't enter a house where a dog is. So it's understandable that he would not only stab the man, but stab the dog. And, and, and that was uh, on the issue of dogs. That was that was after he, he, he made the exceptions after his followers complained to him because it was first it was just kill all dogs and it was uh, what's crazy is the historical background for that he's supposed to meet with the angel gabriel and the angel gabriel doesn't show up for his meeting and he's all he's he's all whining oh why why did the angel gabriel stand me up and they found a puppy in the house and of course uh, angels won't enter a house with a dog and that's when he ordered his followers uh kill all dogs and so at that point they're they're just running around running around mass killing dogs and they said even even the dog of a of a bedouin right so you know traveling people who live in the desert and stuff like that they're they're going after their dogs to kill them and so on and then people complain you know i, I kind of need my dog for help with hunting and this and that and then okay well except for dogs in those situations and except for the black dog the black dog is satan according to muhammad which leads to the obvious question why has it got to be the black dog, Muhammad? Why indeed? Just uh, like the passages in the Quran, actually, where the skin of the damned is black. Okay, shall we go to France again? What is, you know, all this talk about France. Yes. 
I mean, it really, really confirms. It really confirms what what the basically the the stages of jihad that we talk about. Um, mm -hmm. That you know, it, based on the percentage or strength or status of people in a population that. Uh, determines how you act towards the unbelievers. And uh, looking at um, New York Times article right now, uh, complaining about how thing how bad things are for Muslims in France right now, and saying that they're 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 being forced to to leave France because it's it's so uncomfortable there. But uh, I, they say around ten percent of the population of France is now Muslim. And so. If you, you have around 1% of the population of the United States uh, is Muslim, around 10% of France, and then in places like Saudi Arabia, you know, m massive majorities and so on. But you can see how the message of Islam just changes depending on the percentage of Muslims in a society. I'm saying that because every time we sit down for this week in jihad, you have multiple stories from France. Oh, yeah. And the message of Islam changes, you said. This is very important because the first stage when you're vastly outnumbered and powerless, like the Muslims in Mecca, then you preach tolerance like chapter 109. Uh, you have your religion, we have ours. We'll essentially, we'll leave each other alone. But then the second stage is much more aggressive. And that's what we're getting to in France. I don't think this would happen in the United States, but this is an interesting incident. There was a guy coming around with a uh, video camera and a microphone, and he's doing men on the street interviews. And uh, I have the uh, the video at Jihad Watch. It's in French, but uh, it, I translated it. And what we have is the guy goes up to, he's a kid. He, it's, a, it's obviously a young people's show, whatever show it is. Uh, and he goes up to a group of Muslim young men probably about 20 years old. And he says, what would you do? Because France is having a presidential election right now. What would you do if you were president of France? And the young Muslims he talked to, they start to give him a list of what they would do. Uh, the first thing is a genocide of the Jews. And then they would go to start on the homosexuals. And uh, they say this, you know, everybody's joking around, but it's very clear that they're quite serious about this. And they say with the homosexuals, actually, it's a bit more complicated, but with the Jews, it's unequivocal. Genocide right away. And uh, I'm, I guess we shouldn't be surprised. Uh, I mean, you, you've, you've got people in the UK and the United States openly calling for the public execution of apostates and for for all kinds of other things. And they're just they're extremely they're extremely popular. You cannot it's not just you're OK saying these kinds of things. If someone randomly comes up to you on the street, you can be shouting these things uh, on YouTube and Twitter and they're totally fine with it. But we <laughs> If you say, "Hey, all that stuff's bad. Don't follow that," then you're then you're bad. You're bad because you're a you're you're an Islamophobe. It's, just, it's like I mean, if you if you were to write a story about some imaginary planet and the people there were this dumb, I would think that the, the story is too silly, man. The story is too ridiculous, and yet here we are, real life. Yeah, I think a story like that it just wouldn't fly. Mm -hmm. uh, here's another example of that, as a matter of fact. Uh, this is a mother of seven children from Djibouti who moved from Djibouti to France. And then she took her, started to take her daughters back to Djibouti. It took her three eldest daughters to Djibouti where uh, she had genital mutilation performed upon them. And uh, she was just given a five-year suspended prison sentence in France for doing this because uh, female genital mutilation is illegal in France. But it's interesting, the most interesting part of this story is that the mother from Djibouti, she says, I behaved like a good Djiboutian mother. And she said that the genital mutilation of her daughters was a religious necessity in Islam. 
Now, this is noteworthy because in the American press, whenever there's stories about FGM, the the AP or Reuters or the New York Times or whoever is saying talking about it hastens to assure us that there is no justification in any religion for female genital mutilation, that it's solely a cultural practice. And yet again and again, we find Muslims, including clerics, saying this is an Islamic practice that you must do if you're a Muslim. Yeah. Um... I'm in a really difficult spot right now because uh, you're talking about one of the most horrible practices in the world, female genital mutilation. And everyone is just talking about you mentioning the country Djibouti. <laughs> and that messed up. We're, we're, we're here. We're talking about some horrible, horrible stuff. And everyone's going, oh, oh, Djibouti. And then they're saying, then they're all bringing up Sheikh Yabuti, which is uh, the apostate yeah. prophet's uh, character, Sheikh Yabuti. And uh, what, a, what a tough world we live in. We, we, could be we could be talking about the worst practice in the world. <laughs> okay, kids. In the former French territory of the Afars and Issas, all this happens. From now on, I will refer to Djibouti as the former French territory of the Afars and Issas. You see what you've brought him to, everyone? You see what you've done now? <laughs> and everybody will say, where? What? Anyway... Also in France, in another place, Grenoble, a Muslim screaming Allahu Akbar fired a gun into the air, terrorizing school children, forcing a school closing. After the area was searched, the school was reopened. But this is a classic example of striking terror in the enemies of Allah. Speaking of striking terror, in Germany, in prison, a Muslim prisoner threatened to behead another prisoner who he believed had insulted Allah. This is, of course, not something that German law recognizes, but he doesn't care about German law. Also not caring about German law is Abdul Malik A, who is an Afghan Muslim who has been in Germany since 2015. And a few years back, he's 29 years old now. And uh, actually, it was September 4th, 2021. So it was just a, just a few months ago. This woman, a German woman, 58 years old, was working in her garden and trimming the shrubs in front of her house. And he came up and started to stab her multiple times, mostly in the neck, but also elsewhere. And uh, I don't believe he killed her because a neighbor interfered and stopped him uh and uh now he claims that she attacked him which i think is interesting because we've seen that kind of thing before i don't know if you remember years ago david uh in buffalo new york there was a uh tv channel bridges tv a yeah, guy who like beheaded his wife or something right right muzamil hassan he beheaded his wife in the studio of their moderate muslim tv network and all, this is all bridges the, bridges tv ladies and gentlemen they're building bridges and yet we see them dividing people actually dividing people's heads from their torsos and he claimed that she was attacking him and that she had been abusing him and he was thus working only in self-defense this dis, uh, disclaiming of responsibility is quite common among islamic jihadis yeah so yeah you're, you're for any you know jihadis who may be watching, you're you're always going to lose the uh, "I beheaded her in self-defense" um, claim. You're going to lose that one. Also, Abdul Malik uh, A was photographed. I have the photo on Jihad Watch now uh, at his trial, grinning happily. And people think, people say, "What a ghoul!" He stabs this woman multiple times, and now he's grinning. But actually, this is all part of his jihadi beliefs because he believes that he has struck the neck of the unbeliever as per Allah's command and that Allah is going to reward him for carrying out his command. So what has he got to be unhappy about? Yeah, that's that's the other rule. If you're going to use the uh, I beheaded her in self-defense uh, tactic, um, don't be grinning. Indeed. Don't grin in court. <laughs> I would consider all this stuff obvious, but they, they, they don't get it. 
Speaking of obvious, David, let's go to India, <laughs> where in India, a famed Instagram influencer with a podcast or something on Instagram, whatever they call these things, these kids today, and uh, she has her friend on, and uh, she really loves this guy. She uh, Sabnam is her name, and his name is Nadim, and she called him the funniest guy, and she's giggling all through the show. Now, meanwhile, this is what she's giggling about. Nadim says, I have seen three Hindus being killed in front of my eyes. They die daily in our area. They should be killed openly. Uh, and he goes, she's giggling all through this. And he goes on, Hindu religion is nothing. These people imagine things. One God has the head of something else. Another is half and half. These people are the garbage of the world. And Sabnan says, I'm choking laughing. Nadim, you're the comedy king, seriously. And then Nadim really gets down to it. He says, if anyone wants to report me, go ahead. If I had an AK-47, I would have identified and killed them one by one. Hindus should be raped. I will do it. I have raped three Hindu women. Uh, Meanwhile, classic, girlfriend... classic Islamic humor. Yeah. That guy's, like, then... that guy's like the Islamic uh, Eddie Murphy, apparently. Absolutely. And then when this comes out and people are all indignant with these two Muslims running this show, uh, Sabnam, whose show it was, she writes on Instagram, uh, for the first time, you have been giving me rape and death threats for the last two days. You were abusing my religion. I cannot take it anymore. Classic victim card, of course. Yeah, and, and more, more hypocrisy. They, they don't seem to understand... Uh, my, and this is really the same thing with uh, you know with with the Uyghurs and so on. So I, I've I've uh, I've talked about um, what's going on with the Uyghurs in China and so on, and how they're being hauled off to camps and so on in in China. Um, but the the hypocrisy. See, I I'm consistent, so I can I can say that because I can I can say hey I condemn it when it's being done to Muslims. I condemn it if it's being done to Hindus. I condemn it if it's being done to Christians. I condemn it if it's become uh, being done to Jews or atheists or whoever. Um, but the you know the popular uh, Muslims on YouTube and so on. Look at what they're doing to look at and and everything they're complaining about sounds exactly like what they say they're going to do <laughs> to all unbelievers, and it's uh, they don't get it. And as you noted at the beginning of the show, David, it is indeed Ramadan. And just to underscore what that means, as soon as I find it, uh, nope, excuse me just a minute. It's got to be around here somewhere. Uh, ah, yes, the Supreme Sharia judge of the Palestinian Authority, Mahmoud al-Habash, he said, Ramadan is a month of jihad, conquest, and victory. And so we see that there has been a rash of jihad attacks in Israel, 11 people killed in separate attacks, and then thousands of Muslims, all screaming Allahu Akbar, marching in solidarity with not the victims, but the perpetrators in Israel. These are not Palestinians, actually, but Israeli Arabs who are ostensibly loyal to the Israeli state. And, of course, also in Israel over the last week, a group of Muslims broke into Joseph's tomb and vandalized it, which I thought was interesting because, of course, Joseph is a prophet in Islam as well as in Judaism and Christianity. So I was actually asked earlier about why is it that they would destroy the tomb of their one of their own prophets? But, of course... In Sunni Islam, and Hamas and Islamic Jihad are Sunni groups, venerating the tombs of the prophets, that's idolatry, that's shirk. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they don't have any regard for the tombs of the prophets because they believe that they will tempt one away from the worship solely of Allah. Yeah, that was, um, uh, ISIS did the same thing. Yes. Interesting to note that one of the murderers who committed one of these jihad attacks, he started out in a mosque in Jaffa. He prayed there in the mosque. Then he went out, carried out his attack. I believe he killed two people, if I'm not mistaken. And 
then tried to return to the mosque, clearly situating his act in his Islamic devotion for Ramadan. Yeah, that <clears throat> that's totally that's, we that's totally weird again. I mean, it's like it's like it's all got something to do with Islam. Yeah, you would almost get that idea. I don't know where you could. Yeah, for, get fortunately, that. we just know better from instinct or something because. Uh, well, oh, this is an interesting one, David. Uh, also out of India, relating to India, that is. We talked several weeks ago, quite some time ago, actually, about the hijab controversy in India. Mm -hmm. You emphasized quite rightly that, uh, you know, you don't believe there should be coercion from authorities in terms of uh, the conscience of the various people involved. But it's interesting to note that Ayman Azawahiri, the head of Al-Qaeda, who many people thought was dead, was reported dead in 2020, he took this opportunity to reappear for the first time in a couple of years in order to use the hijab controversy in India to call for jihad in India. And uh, he said that the Muslims are being persecuted by a mob of Hindu polytheists and that uh, the banning of the hypocrisy of this exposes the true nature of the West, which was exposed in France, Holland, and Switzerland when he said they banned the hijab while allowing public unity. And he said the enemies of Islam are one and the same. Those fighting the hijab in Egypt are the same as those in India. And uh, consequently, the ummah needs to unite and fight jihad in order to defend the hijab altogether. And here again, it's not really a problem. Uh, people should be able to wear the hijab if they truly wish to. But the problem is that many women are brutalized, threatened, even killed for not wearing the hijab. And that's the real coercion. But uh, of course, Azawahiri believes that's a good thing. And there's nothing to say about that. Yeah. So uh, once again, you have the you basically have you have you have pos positions like ours where we're consistent where we're consistent. We say, uh, hey, no side here should be forcing the other side to, you know, it's one thing if you say don't walk around naked or something like that. But if you're just saying, hey, you know, I want to put a cloth around my head or something like that or or I want to take the cloth off of my head. You know, I would normally say, hey, I don't think governments and so on should be uh, controlling decisions like that for people. But here again, you have the hypocrisy where, I mean, you know, Muslim sheikhs and imams, they want to control everyone. They want to control what everyone's wearing. And as soon as someone tries to control it in a way that goes against the way they're trying to control it, then it's we have to wage jihad. We have to we have to we have to go around slaughtering people in the name of Allah over this. Not just, hey, you ladies, well, don't go to school there. We'll we'll have we'll make a separate school for you where you can wear whatever you want and fine. If that school doesn't want you, then uh, don't go to that school. Let that be your protest against their their rules. Instead of doing that, nope, it's uh we gotta have a bloodbath here. And uh, um I don't think they'll win that one in India, man. I don't think they'll I don't think they'll win that one over there. Well, there's a lot of unrest, uh, mm -hmm. a lot of jihad attacks in India. Let me see. Uh, the, recently, there was a religious procession, a Hindu religious procession that was stoned. Ram, Nava, Ram Navani Ravami, excuse me, pr procession passing into Muslim areas, and they threw rocks at the procession. Uh, a Muslim was caught vandalizing the idols in another Hindu temple. Uh, this is something, I, I, it's, it's, it's getting more violent, I think, in India, uh, probably because here again, like you were saying about France, with 10%, the Muslim percentage is even more in India. And so there's ongoing unrest. Oh, and, and I mean, that, that's a place where, I mean... Things can escalate very, very, very quickly because you have, you know, this group goes and, uh, and attacks a, a temple and then then those people want want retaliation and so on. And all of a sudden, people who weren't fighting all of a sudden end up taking sides and you could uh, things could get very, very bad and very, very bloody there very quickly. Speaking of rapid escalation, 
story out of Bangladesh, right next door, uh, where there were rumors about a blasphemous Facebook post rumors. that was rumors that a Hindu had hurt religious sentiments in a Facebook post. And so because this started to uh, circulate, hundreds of people gathered around this uh, Hindu gentleman's house. They uh, vandalized the house, set a nearby haystack on fire, and then proceeded on to a Hindu temple where they destroyed the fence before they were stopped. Uh, so this is over something that may not have happened at all, you understand. But the rumor is enough to set off these mobs in Pakistan, India, Bangladesh. And it's uh, it's it's similar because I posted a video this morning about um, uh, Mohammed Kache in oh, Indonesia, yeah. but it's similar to that situation where when people are coming after you over a Facebook post, and especially when it's uh, the, the crime is hurting people's religious feelings or something like that. Uh, and notice, notice the notice the inconsistency once again. I mean, I could say, hey, the Quran calls Jews and Christians the worst of creatures, and the Quran says that Muslims are the best of peoples, and the Quran says you can violently subjugate us because of our beliefs and so on. You see that that's hurting my religious feelings, and it's never a factor. It's never a factor. It's too bad. Too bad. Live with it. Live with it. Yep. It's all well, right. It's all right. But then, but then it's a uh, yeah. Then it's a uh, then when it. When it's, hey, you did a Facebook post that hurts our religious feelings. Someone has to die now. Mm -hmm. Well, Indonesia does not have the freedom of speech. And they do have laws against hurting religious sentiments. And they have been used to defend Christianity. I do not subscribe to this. I believe in the freedom of speech. I don't think people should be prosecuted for this. But it should be noted that a Christian who became a Muslim, and became an imam, Muhammad Yahya Waloni, he uh, insulted Christianity, and he was sentenced in Indonesia last year to five months in prison. Now, compare that to Muhammad Kache, who's exactly the parallel of Muhammad Yahya Waloni. Muhammad Kache is a former imam who became a Christian and then criticized Islam, and his sentence is 10 years. So five months for insulting Christianity, 10 years for insulting Islam. And also, of course, in the photographs that were published at the time that the sentence was announced, Mohammed Kache is standing there with a black eye and his eyes swollen shut. And so it's clear that he is being brutalized in prison as well. Yeah, and uh, I, I pointed that out. I mean, I pointed to those two things out in my video. It's like uh, Indonesia wants to pretend that it's fair towards all and therefore it just makes it a rule no hurting people's uh, religious feelings with blasphemy against their religion but then you look at the punishments handed out and it's uh okay we'll give you five months but we'll give you 10 years and the 10 years for muhammad kache is going to be far far worse than it would be for the muslim because he's he's already in a place where he's being uh, brutalized and tortured and so it's basically 10 years of beatings and torture for being in there as the guy who was in there for uh, for blasphemy against uh, against Islam. And uh, Christian, uh, Christian Hijab here pointed out, she said, uh, it's OK to act on rumors. Going back to our previous point, it's OK to act on rumors. It's like when the Quran encourages beating your wife. If you fear uh, arrogance, yeah. you are to beat her. But yeah, th that is a problem in Islam. It's not just this person has to do something that's. Ah, I fear that person has done something, and that's enough to to start uh, to start violence. That's a good point. One final to close. Uh, Jordanian Islamic scholar Saeed Radwan said on television last week: "Every country that was ruled by Islam and where the Sharia was implemented is an Islamic country." And so he says, Muslims now understand that this is true for Palestine. They understand that this country must be liberated and returned to the Muslims. But they do not think this way about other countries, like Al-Andalus, which is Spain today. Palestine is no different from Al-Andalus, Pakistan, East Turkestan, and the Uyghurs, or Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Crimea, and other places. 
Pakistan, Palestine is an Islamic country, and so are these countries. This is, of course, based on very simply chapter 2, verse 191 of the Quran. Drive them out from where they drove you out. Spain was Islamic. It's not Islamic now. Crimea was Islamic. It's not Islamic now. So that means the Muslims were driven out. And they have a divine responsibility before Allah to drive out those who drove them out and make the land Islamic again. And we, we've we've pointed this out before that uh, for decades now, the attention has been focused on Israel as a place that was once controlled by Islam, but then now is not anymore. And how the emphasis seems to be all on Israel as far as uh, Muslims around the world are concerned. It seems to be just because that's sort of the closest to the heart of the Muslim world, but that if that were ever to change and, that, and they were to get back control uh, there, that the attention would just shift to, you know, Spain or something like that. You already have people who are, you know, actively want to take Spain back and so on, but it would suddenly become the emphasis of, uh, oh, we're all, we're all being oppressed in Spain and, yeah, weird, weird situation. When, when I mean, uh, once again, it's the, it's the hypocrisy. I mean, Mecca was controlled by pagans, and Muhammad showed up with an army and took it. You know, yeah. free, Where's free, 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 free Mecca, free, free Mecca, free Mecca. Give it back to, give it back to the pagans because they, they once controlled. It. And same thing. I mean, uh, you know, Islam starts, yeah. Islam starts there, and then expands, expands westward across Northern Africa, all the way up into Europe and expands eastward all the way out to India and China. And guys, you did not get there by defense. All right? You didn't get there by defense. So if you want to start saying, hey, well, at one time, some other group controlled it, therefore give it back, be consistent, free Mecca, and then start freeing everything else like a, like a row of dominoes. Yep. Yeah, I, uh, I want the right of return to my ancestral home in Turkey. Uh, when when I get there, David, mm -hmm. it's a beautiful seaside villa, and uh, we will we will host a magnificent uh, Muhammad drawing convention there. Oh, that'd be awesome! That would go over totally well over there. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, yeah. Yeah, there's plenty more jihad, but I see we're out of time. Yep, guys. Well, uh, that's our time for jihad this week. We uh, keep coming back to the issue of jihad because uh, the jihad don't stop. Ladies and gentlemen, the jihad just does not stop. It's been relentless for 14 centuries. And as I pointed out, if you, uh, the vast majority of people, um, even in the world today, even among people who study jihad and the Muslim sources, uh, have no idea how relentless it's been for 14 centuries because we generally only look at the time of Muhammad. We might, people, some people might look at something, you know, around the time of the Crusades. And other than that, we're, we'll be familiar with some of the things going on today, like ISIS and so on. When, if you get Robert's book, The History of Jihad, uh, you, it's just never stopped. There's never been a time when jihad was not trying to advance. The only time it slows down or is paused is because someone someone more powerful than them stopped them from advancing. Uh, anytime jihad could advance, it has been advancing. It has been relentless. And uh, get that book so you can understand it and get the critical Quran. Again, links are in the description box. And uh, I saw people asking about... Uh, the Ramadan Bombathon, because I've covered that in uh, in videos before. And then Glenn over at the religion of peace .com, he always keeps a running tally of jihad attacks. And numbers are fortunately significantly down from, you know, when they were peaking around the time of ISIS, when there were, you know, Ramadan was, was an absolute bloodbath. But even now, when things are relatively much more calm, you still have far, 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 far more attacks carried out in the name of Islam than in all other ideologies combined in the world. So uh, maybe next week when we're talking about this week in jihad, we'll pull up. We'll pull up the latest tally for the Ramadan Bamathon. All right. So uh, thanks, Robert, for joining us. And uh, I guess we'll see you all then.